Mm. This is a magnificent display. It's a glorious celebration of the joys and rewards of growing flowers. Incredible color. You'd think that a perennial border like this would be a mammoth amount of labor. But it's amazing. If you work with nature, you can cut down on a lot of the maintenance involved and make it look more beautiful, too. I'm Barbara Damrosh. And I'm Elliot Coleman. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll give you some tips and hints on how to grow a beautiful flower garden in your backyard. On Gardening Naturally. ready to design a flower garden, I don't just look at pictures of gardens on English estates. I take a walk in a meadow full of wildflowers. I figure the idea of flower gardens originally came from fields of flowers just like these. When I walk through a field like this, I also learn a lot about how to grow flowers. One of the interesting things I've noticed is the things that look the prettiest to me are also the things that make the flowers grow the best. For example, I'm always best pleased by a meadow that has lots of different kinds of flowers in it. Now, for instance, this one has buttercups. There's some purple vetch. Here's some red clover. Some oxide daisy. Over here is my favorite orange hawkweed and some of the yellow kind as well. Oh, here's some white yarrow growing. There must be at least half a dozen others too. When nature provides a lot of different species together, that's because crop diversity or complexity is what makes an ecosystem work. All of these things have different requirements, perhaps different pollinators, and there are a lot of different pollinators around that these need to attract in order to multiply, and the pollinators need these flowers for the pollen. So nature tries to make a lot of these happen all at the same time in one field. You notice that they're all competing with each other and also with the grasses and ferns that are growing in here, but everybody seems to be doing okay. Well, there's a couple of reasons why that works. Some of these are growing very close to the ground. Down here, there's some tiny little strawberry plants. You can see they're starting to bear. But way up here, the tall hawkweeds and the daisies are doing fine. Sometimes a low-growing plant reaches maturity just before things get too tall to shade it. In some cases, the low-growing plant might need the shade of taller things later in the season. It's all part of the plan. Underneath the ground, the same thing is going on. Some of these plants have very shallow roots that creep along the surface. Some have deep tap roots, like this wild asparagus that's growing here. That'll go way down deep, where it won't compete with all of the things that are near the surface, drawing moisture and minerals from way down deep under the soil. So the different strata of the soil at work as well. The other thing that happens with all this complexity is that some bloom earlier in the season, then some in the middle of the season, some late. Every week, the picture changes in this meadow, and that ensures a good supply of pollen for all of the bees and butterflies and other insects all season long. Now, let's go look at a flower garden and see how these principles apply. This is a well-established flower garden planted by Stanley Joseph here at his farm in Harborside, Maine, where he sells cut flowers, dried flower wreaths, and vegetables from... The thing that makes this wonderful flower border work is that the plants are in such well-established clumps that they're almost as self-sufficient as those wildflowers we saw out there in the meadow. It all depends on choosing things that are going to be so successful where you live in your climate that they're going to become large clumps that completely crowd out weeds. Now, this may be hard to believe, but this border is four years old. Last year, I helped Stan weed it a little bit, and it took me about 20 minutes to go down the whole thing because there were just a few weeds here in the front. This year, he's put in a few annuals like this, Althea zebrina and some clary sage, and I don't think there are any weeds at all in the border. But it is important to pick the right things. A good case in point would be these delphiniums. Now, these don't do well in an awful lot of the country because the summers are too warm for them there. But here in northern New England, 
they thrive because the stems grow very strong and healthy. They don't need staking. We had heavy rain here yesterday, and anywhere else in the country, they probably would have been flopping down. But in the, in the section of country like this, they don't need any staking, and they do well. If you live in a warmer zone, you'd grow something like red hot poker, nifofia. We can't grow that here because it won't survive our winters. But in a warmer place, it would provide the same strong, upright effect that these delphiniums do. Another thing that seems to do well is these shasta daisies, or these lamb's ears, or these golden marguerites, or self-sowers like this opium poppy, or this shirley poppy over here. The other nice thing is that there's a gradation of heights in this border. Now, we saw a lot of different heights combined by nature in the wildflower meadow, but it was more or less random. Here, stands arranged them artistically so that it's like a picture. You look and you see the foreground, the smaller plants, where they won't be hidden by anything else, the middle ground, and then the tall plants along this wonderful stone wall, which was built by Helen and Scott Nearing, the famous homesteaders who once owned this farm. The other thing that Stan has done is he's carefully planned the border so there's a succession of bloom. When they came by here a few months ago, it was filled with iris and shades of pink and lavender and blue, including the blue flag iris, which grows native here and does very well. As it's unfolded, there's been foxgloves and lupins, and now the full summer bloom you see here. In another month, I'll come back, and it'll be full of the loosestrife that's blooming over there, or the rudbeckia that's going to be coming on with its big daisy-like flowers. Again, a native that would choose to grow here, so how could it help but do well? And even a stand of goldenrod that just sewed itself in here. And Stan, being a smart guy, decided to leave it. It was born here, and it'll do great. So with all of this diversity of flowers, we have a lovely picture, but we also have something that works, that succeeds. It provides a nectar source for insects, for butterflies, for bees, for hummingbirds, all season long. And that's what a successful garden should do. That's looking almost done, Elliot. Almost ready. We chose this little 5 foot by 11 foot spot for a flower garden for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's right next to the front door, and we're going to enjoy it every time we come in and out this summer. The other reason is that it gets full sun for almost the entire day, and a lot of flowers like that. <clears throat> we have some pretty good soil here now, but we didn't before. This was a construction site until recently. The builders, when they built the house, had left a lot of fill here, so we literally excavated the whole thing, put an entire bale of moistened peat in here, and about an inch layer of compost, some rock phosphate, and then we forked it in like this. And that is just great. Now, the secret to what's going to make this garden tick is the organic matter, the peat and the compost that we've added. It means that I can combine a lot of species with a lot of different needs, and they'll all do well. Those that need sort of dry, well-drained soil, they'll get that because of the organic matter. Those that need plenty of moisture around their roots will get it again because of the organic matter. So what I've done is try to think of a number of species that will go well here. And I've made a little plan. I did a lot of homework for this, and I find that no matter how well you know your perennials, it pays off to do a little sketch ahead of time. I've put the tall ones in the back, the medium height ones in the middle, and the low ones in front, drawing from a list of things that I just thought would be pretty in the garden. And I made a list of the heights and when they might be blooming, early, middle, or late in the summer. I've chosen almost entirely native species or hybrids of them. So here we are, ready to go with those plants, Elliot. Well, they're all lined up here. I'll hand them to you. Okay, That's let's start with some tall red bee balm over here for the butterflies and the hummingbirds as much as the bees. Some flux, maculata, rosalind, mildew resistant, some anise hyssop, which has tall purple spikes, some Kansas gay feather, Good prairie plant with tall purple spikes in summer, and a tall blue salvia, and a uh, purple coneflower, another prairie species that will be wonderful. Here we have a western species, um, blanket flower. That will sort of be gay and colorful, won't it, Elliot? And here's another Phlox maculata, Miss Lingard. She's a little shorter and more um, early blooming than Rosalind behind her. Will the tall ones get tall enough to cover that junction box? Oh, sure. That, that Anna's hyssop will cover it, and then in, in front, there's Rebecca Goldsturm, 
That'll, that'll hide it too. That's like a black-eyed Susan. And then some daylilies, which are not native, but can't resist to put them in. And some pearly everlasting, which is a wonderful wildflower that has papery white flowers good for drying. And no garden should be without butterfly weed. And some threadleaf coreopsis. This has a bright yellow star-shaped flower and some wild blue lobelia to spill out over this edging. That's one of my favorites. Oh, that's great. And then asters. This one is Professor Kippenberg. The professor is, has a sort of a lavender blue flower, but short. And this is Coreopsis again. Uh, again, the threadleaf kind, but a pale yellow star-like flower. And Ozark Sundrop. These flowers are like big yellow golden buttercups, and it'll spill out over the edging here. And finally, another New England aster hybrid called Purple Dome for late in the season. I think we need Seven something three. along the edging. There's so, so many white-leaved plants that you can get, the Dusty Millers and the Artemisias, but I like this native, which is Pussy Toes, and the Pussy Toes will spill out over the edging in time. They'll take a while to form a mat, but we can plant some little annuals in between while we're waiting to get impatient. Now, before, well, I think before we plant, I always like to take a kind of reality check and Make sure everything's in the right place. The bee balm has plenty of room to get into a big clump. And notice the rudbeckia, that forms a big clump. Space these out exactly the way I want them. Here, that should do it. If you want to start mulching, I can dig the rest of the hole. Well, that sounds like a good bit of teamwork. Get this planted by lunchtime. When most people think of perennial vegetables, they usually think of asparagus. That's a great example. Well, here's another one that's just as delicious you might not be familiar with. This is called sorrel, closely related to the weed by the same name, sometimes called lemongrass, that you may have eaten as a child. Only in this case, this plant has been worked on for years by plant breeders in order to make it bigger and more vigorous. You eat the leaves, they have that nice lemony tang that you expect, either chopped up in a little bit in salads, but especially as the famous French sorrel soup, an absolutely delicious way to prepare this unique green. Now, you'll see this in the herbs section of seed catalogs, often just under the name sorrel or under a variety name, Belleville. But either way, once you've planted it, you don't need to plant seeds again because as a perennial, you can divide it just the way you might divide perennial flowers. A plant this size, I could probably get four divisions out of. First, I'd cut off the leaves or cut them way back so it wouldn't be under stress because I will have disturbed some roots. And then I'd just take my spade cut it in four sections, and move them on to where I want to put them. We'll divide like that is some of your plants may be tastier, prettier, grow better, have nicer shaped leaves than others, and that's the one you can select to move on. Now, I've transplanted these into a cold frame, and that's because in addition to being delicious, it's also very hardy. And by covering this cold frame with glass through the colder months, I can keep this wonderful food producing through almost the whole year. This is a brand new perennial garden. I just planted it this spring. Now, a perennial garden doesn't usually look like much the first year. Next year, all of these clumps are going to be much fuller. There's going to be more color. But I must say, it hasn't done a bad job of displaying itself. That's because I had a few tricks up my sleeve, so I'm going to share those with you. For one thing, as I'm walking along here, I get a nice view of the garden. But from where you're looking at it, you get an even better view, because you're seeing the whole thing foreshortened. You get a lot of saturation of color. I planned it that way because from over here is where I'm going to view it most, from the house. So that's where we get the best view. The other thing I've done is make sure there's a good succession of bloom in the garden. I started off in June with some peonies and some iris, things like that. Those were joined by coreopsis and yarrow and other things. And right now it's Veronica time. This is Veronica blue charm, this nice blue one. Here's a little pink form. Here's a dark blue form called Sunny Border Blue that I just adore. And there's a white one over here called Icicle. These are being joined by the red bee balm, the purple gay feathers, the purple cone flower, and lots of things right now. Later on, we're going to have some asters where you see just clumps of green, some heleniums, and these lovely late sedums that are already looking interesting while they're in bud. Now, the trouble with perennials is that they only bloom for a certain length of time, and they sort of take turns blooming, so you have some gaps in the border. 
Well, one way to get around that is to plant as many long blooming perennials as you possibly can. These yellow coreopsis are a perfect example. They've been blooming for over a month and show no signs of stopping. Or these yellow yarrows here. They've helped a lot to keep the show going. Now, I have another sneaky little trick I can tell you. Some of these plants here are annuals. I couldn't really afford to fill the whole bed up with perennials the first year anyway, so I grew some annuals from seed. You know, I find that a lot of the long-blooming perennials are middle-of-the-border plants, ones of medium height. So it's the back and the front I often have to worry about. So I grew some tall cosmos, the pink and purple kind, and put them in the back row there, where they're very flowery. And some white nicotianas towering over that corner there to keep the back in flower. And then in the foreground here, I got some cute little chrysanthemum padulosums that were very easy to grow from seed. And over here, some toad flax, linaria, which makes a nice show over on this corner in front here. Now, what this all adds up to is as many flowers as possible, as much color as possible, all the time. But that's not my only goal. I kind of consider this a working garden, too. Because with all of those flowers, I'm attracting more and more insects with the nectar. Butterflies, bees, even hummingbirds. And also, by attracting insects, I'm attracting the birds that eat them. And I love to have birds around my property. Another way that I help ensure that there's lots of wildlife around is by including as many native plants as possible. Somehow, I just feel that the wildlife feels more at home if there are plants that are at home in the garden, too. Take this corner of the garden, for example. This is a native prairie plant called Kansas gay feather, or blazing star. The Latin name is Liatris pycnostachia. And it looks absolutely wonderful next to this other prairie plant, which is, is a purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. Over here is a beautiful white plant called fairy candles, or snake root is another common name for it. That'll be a little bigger next year as the clump enlarges, and it'll be waving those candles in the back of the border. And then over here, this Monarda blue stocking, or bee balm, it's often called, is a wild plant. This is a civilized version of it. Somehow the plants in this grouping just seem appropriate together. Now over here in another part of the garden, I'm really getting into prairie plants. After all, a lot of our sunny meadow species can be found out in the prairies of the Midwest, or were, till it was all dug up for farmland. So there's a great interest in reviving them. A lot of these plants are not easy to find. You have to go to a specialty prairie nursery. There are a lot of mail-order companies that can provide you with things like this tall ox-eye sunflower, this wonderful tall yellow plant, or this tall liatris. This one's called pl prairie blazing star. Or this tall ironweed that's going to be purple in a couple of weeks. There's some shorter prairie plants here I've got as well. This is a butterfly weed that's going to be opening any minute now. And of course, if it's really going to be a prairie ecology year, I've got to have some grasses as well, because that's what would happen in the wild. You'd have grasses coexisting with the flowering plants, which are called forbs. Now, ornamental grasses are really the big thing these days, and they really are beautiful in gardens. But I figure why plant a Japanese or a European grass when we've got such beautiful native ones, like this prairie drop seed? It's very small right now because it takes a few seasons to attain its full shape. But what that shape is going to be is a wonderful bushel basket-sized mound of, of drooping foliage. And I can't wait to see that next year. I find that more and more I like to have an informal wildflower look to my flower garden as if I wanted to take all the meadows around this countryside and encapsulate them into one perfect spot filled with birds and bees and butterflies. Now, speaking of cramming everything into one little spot, remember that tiny flower garden we planted over by the house with native perennial species? Let's go and see how it's turned out a few months later. This first year border certainly has far more color than I expected, and the plants have grown so well. Oh, they're putting on a great show, aren't they? Spectacular. These little red leaf coreopsis are bright and cheerful, especially next to this wonderful blanket flower I told you about, that western species. That's from the west coast. Right. These blue lobelias haven't bloomed yet, but that white Miss Lingard phlox has been blooming for weeks now. The anise hyssop got enormous. And those rudbeckias, aren't now, they, they They look like black-eyed Susans. Well, they are black-eyed Susans. I mean, it's a cultivated variety called Goldsturm. 
But basically, yes, it's black-eyed Susan. And these little thread-leaf Coreopsis, that variety called Moonbeam, I love that. And it's, it's great with this, recognize this, Elliot? It grows right in the fields and edges of the woods, right where we live. Sure. It's pearly everlasting. That's right. It's that wonderful thing you can hang upside and dry. Feel how papery that is? <laughs> and the blazing stars over there are in full bloom, and the purple cone flower. Yeah, we still have a lot to look forward to. These tall varana costumes haven't bloomed yet. Oh, they're going to be nice, Yeah, aren't they? or any of the asters, not to mention that blue lobelia. So the season isn't over yet, either. Mm. But the thing that I really get impressed by is that all of these are Native American plants, and they're putting on this spectacular display. It sort of makes me feel patriotic. <laughs> you know what it makes me feel, too? That the same things that I find beautiful in a garden crop diversity and lots of different colors, lots of different heights, uh, a lot of succession of bloom, saturation of color. Those are all the same things that the wildlife like, too. Those are the mm -hmm. things that are going to attract the birds and the bees and the hummingbirds. It almost makes me feel like it's some part, part of a plan. You know, I often wonder why humans find flowers beautiful. Is it because we're supposed to plant more of them? I guess that's what natural flower gardening is all about. Well, that's what natural gardening in general is all about. I guess we're on the right track. For now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how. Thank you.